Thank you, Kelly. Opens to something greater than themselves. Um, it allows grace to enter our lives. So I want to speak some about the, the initiatory stages of the quest, just as a general, and then we'll talk about this program specifically that Kelly and Dana um, are guiding. And so we begin with the calling. You know, what, what calls someone to the initiatory journey <clears throat> or to <clears throat> uh, awaken <clears throat> to a different way of, of living, believing, um, loving, doing? And um, callings can look like a lot of different things. Um, most of the time they do not look like uh, like this spiritual awakening that one feels this draw towards something. Uh, most of the time, it looks like an utter disaster. <laughs> Things are broken. Things are not working. What All the old maps that you have relied on are, are of no use anymore, and nobody's given you a new map yet. And so we could say that's a, that's a calling. That's a a calling to stop, to pay attention, uh, to, uh, to notice what's happening. Um, and it can be a, a more of a spiritual type of calling, an awakening. It can be an illness. It is whatever happens in our life that says, hey, look over here. Um, and if you turn, if you respond towards the calling, and not everyone does, um, that one can refuse the call. It's kind of a, the language that Joseph Campbell spoke of back in the early 90s when he was around. Um, one can simply refuse the calling. And um, in my judgment, their life simply becomes a, a repetition of, uh, of sameness and, and, and challenge. Uh, with uh, distractions of shiny things that look different but end up being the same. Um, and yet the calling is asking us for us to, uh, to start letting go. And I think that's the why sometimes people refuse the call, is this difficulty in, in letting go. If you respond to the call, then a whole other lot of things happen. Callie was talking about following these threads. Um, and uh, it, it, you turn and respond to the call. And as soon as you start responding, if it hasn't happened already, uh, things start falling away. Because you're turning your navigational instruments and your, your navigational course in a different direction. And with that, changes start to happen. Often, uh, this is where we call you enter the severance phase when you respond to the calling. And the severance phase is this way in which uh, things begin to drop away. Um, it could be as clear as uh, you don't want to work in that job anymore and you just can't do that and you, you let it go. Or this, or a relationship or even something more internal is that certain beliefs that you held um, don't seem to be as solid as they once were. And you find yourself letting go of those old beliefs, those old ways of loving, those old survival strategies. Um, and in the process of this severance and this letting go, um, there is not uh, this immediate ground in which you have to stand on. Um, although most of the time we... we th we think about it that way in terms of, well, I'm, I've let go of this, but I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing next, or I've, I'm still looking for what's that next thing. And yet the, the ground that you've now stepped into, once you deliberately uh, step into the severance phase and those things start falling away or deliberately letting them go, is that now you've entered the threshold phase. Um, and this actually can be more uncomfortable than the other two, um, because this is the place of not knowing. Um, I can't tell you how many people that uh, have come to me um, feeling, some feeling like all prepared, yes, I want to do this. 
And some people come utterly broken and in tears and just say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And it's like, that, that's a prayer. I don't know what to do is a prayer. And it's an invitation to spirit, to grace, to enter the scene. Because as long as you know what to do, there's not a whole lot more room for grace to enter. Um, grace and spirit usually wait until we run out of our own knowing. <laughs> then it enters the scene. Um, so this, this sometimes getting to this place of surrender, I said, I don't know what to do. And when I hear that people are in that place of, oh, that, that's a prayer. That's a prayer. That's, that's what, that's the prayer up on the mountain. That's what the, the uh, Lakota mean, um, when the, the name they have for this particular ceremony being Hemblecha. It means to cry for a vision. It doesn't mean you know your vision and you're looking to, to figure it out and, and make it. It means you don't know and you're crying for one. Um, so this, uh, this ground called the threshold, that's also um, the phase of the ceremony that most people think of when they hear the word vision quest. Like, oh, that's when you go out in the woods for, you know, three, four days and nights or something. And it's like, well, that's just one phase. It takes a village to put somebody up on the mountain. It takes a village to bring them back down. Um, and uh, so the ceremony speaks of the whole experience. The going up on the mountain is the threshold phase or going out in the desert or, or going and walking into the unknown with the hopes of having an experience of the unknowable. Um, so this is the, this is the, this, the solo time of the, of the quest. And then there's, uh, if you allow yourself to be broken open enough, um, you will have an experience that offers you a memory of the medicine that you carry. And I say it that way because um, in Africa, they say all learning is simply remembering. And these initiatory passages throughout history were designed at different developmental life stages to activate the memory of who you are and the medicine you came into this world to deliver at this time in your life. So it's not like it's giving you something you don't have. It's just uh, uh, removing you from all the distractions of life and putting you in a place of quiet solitude until the, the thinking mind finally surrenders and becomes still and then things start shifting and happening internally, externally. Um, and then this, uh, as I say, going around the wheel when you're out there on the mountain can feel like a, a emotions and feelings and memories. And um, it's like sometimes a first quest can be like a life review where it just every single thing in your life um, that has been unresolved comes up to be resolved between you and the trees and you and the wind and you and the water. Um, these things come up uh, looking for an out, looking to be released through your emotions, through your heart. Um, and then on the other side of those uh, cycling around the medicine wheel like that during those four days, each time you go through that kind of passage, you come to a place of stillness and clarity. Um, and it could, you could cycle through that several times on the mountain. Um, and then there's the return phase of the quest. This is uh, returning back to, immediately back to the village that you left, um, that's holding the space at base camp for you to go up on the mountain, that are keeping that fire burning 24 hours a day while you're out there and, and speaking your prayers at the fire and, and singing those songs at the fire while you're on the mountain. Um, and then there's a return back to that village in which you're, you're welcomed into the village as, uh, as someone we don't know yet. We know who left, but we don't know yet who's returned. You might have a different name when you come off that mountain. Um, 
but we the, the guides are trying to look to receive you back as, as like welcoming uh, a, a long friend that you I'm not sure of their story yet and you welcome them back into the village uh, through a threshold ceremony and um, and then there's of course a big feast because right you're, you'll be hungry four days of fasting is is enough to work up a little appetite and um, and so we feast and we celebrate your return and then rest and then following the the feasting and the resting we have what's called the council of elders and we hear the stories and we reflect back to you what we hear in your story of your medicine uh, and of the challenges that we might hear um, and i tell people that these kinds of stories that the, like the returning from the mountain uh, and you'll hear this uh, during quest when your guides tell you these stories aren't simply about what happened in the past four days with you out in the out on the mountain they're roadmaps into where you are going and so your guides mirror these stories back to you not simply as a, a reflection of of the past four days but they mirror them back to you in terms of the roadmap that they hear about where you're headed and also the medicine that you're carrying down that road. Um, so calling, severance, threshold, return. You could even say there's another one that, that some guides speak of called the, the uh, I call it sometimes the giveaway or sometimes it's referred to as the incorporation phase. Um, but the, the giveaway when you return back to your greater village um, away from base camp and back back into your to your homes that you left that your giveaway is really about how you live your life moving forward that's your giveaway um, and the incorporation of your experience uh, takes uh, what it takes and it, it, uh, it takes uh, weeks months years Things will unravel from your experience that can come, uh, become loosened in a moment, 15 years from your quest, and all of a sudden you, you see something, realize something you didn't see before from that whole story, and all of a sudden it makes sense because now you're living it. Um, so I just want to say there are roadmaps into where you're headed. Some of the things in those kind of uh, questing stories can't be known until you get way down the road and you find yourself living that story and that's like oh this is what that meant 15 years ago i didn't know it till now um, so outlining those uh those phases of the journey um and they don't always come in a neat package as we know nothing comes neatly wrapped in sequential order just like that um but you, but participating, you will go up on the mountain. You will be prepared. Go up on the mountain and return. Those are certain. the The state in which you return is um, uh, highly suspect and questionable. <laughs> if all goes well, <laughs> right? See, reminds me of. Um, let's see if I can find this real quick. It's a spontaneous moment of. Uh, um, can't find it there's a little little poem entry about the the journey um so i want to um pause a moment and invite callie and dana to maybe there's a story that one of you recall about a severance or a threshold or a calling or a return um, that we can bring to life a little more um with with some story um so why don't uh kelly can we open up to you here first and then let you in terms of those different yeah. phases what's what's one that comes to mind of your mm. own or of another that we you know hold the hold the participants and anonymously but sure sure no i have enough of my own to uh <laughs> to share a little, uh, enough of my own trouble. So, 
was thinking about the the severance. So my first quest, my first quest, I got into addiction recovery. And that was a severance all on its own and have a little story about that that I'll share. Uh, my second quest, I went to graduate school. And my third quest, I decided to quit my full-time job and start a business. And, you know, each one of those, the intention was, here's what I'm severing and I don't have any idea what I'm walking into. And yeah. each time I remember really utter fear, um, particularly with the first one. If anyone is familiar with addiction and recovery, uh, severing your, your, the life that you are leading or <laughs> not so much leading, but kind of victim to and chaos in um, and entering into unknown was, was certainly one of the scarier things that I've ever done. And so the way that that looked for me was, uh, I remember, so the day that I actually decided to surrender, I was driving to work and I ran a stop sign and you know, as it would be, there was a police officer there, right? So I got pulled over for running the, running the stop sign. And he came over and I was late to work and I was, you know, all in my, in my, you know, experience and uh, very not present. You know, when you ask about the, the line in the poem that stood out to me the most, I, the one that stood out was, you know, you are this moment. Uh, pay attention. You are this moment. And that snapshot was, you know, that was who I was at that moment. Just complete chaos, running stop signs, not able to be present even with the police officer. <laughs> so he's, you know, he's he's talking to me and I just kept looking in my rear view mirror at the stop sign. And all I could hear was this mantra over and over again that just kept saying, just stop, just stop just surrender. And it was a couple days later that I was able to do that. And that sent me on, you know, it wasn't even a, okay, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to surrender and I've got a plan and now I'm going to, you know, got this that's going on in my life and I'm going to do a quest program. None of that. There was none of that. There was just complete fear and uh, really a, a force that was beyond me that, that helped me get to that place. Um, higher power or spirit, however you define that force, that greater consciousness. And so it wasn't until about a year later that I did my first quest. And that was a way that I really marked that time, marked that initiation into the return, the return to uh, my medicine and who I have agreed to be uh, and the gifts that I've agreed to bring and uh, return to responsibility for my life. So I think about that stop sign. Sometimes I'll be sitting at a stop sign and I'll think about it from time to time. So that's a, that's a story. A good yeah. story. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Callie. Dana of the initiatory phases, which one, which one calls your attention to share about? Um, uh, they're all so good. <laughs> so, so many stories too. Um, you know, I've been thinking, I mean, just cause you know, Callie shared on severance, you know, it got me thinking about severance and, and kind of the, the story that I sort of went into um, during my introduction and, and I just, I remembered that, you know, before my first quest, I had just, well, I, I just had my first child. I lost my dog that was 16 and a half years old, who was like my, just my savior and, uh, was by my side through, I'm in recovery too, through all my addiction and, 
and then finally when you know we were getting ready to have a baby he was like okay it's you know you're you don't you don't need me anymore you know you got and it was a it was it was a he was a really really special animal but anyway and then I actually I was working in substance abuse and we had a business that it's you know it had started out like really truly we you know we're really in it to help people um it became a lot bigger than us it became a lot about money and uh I really fell into that like hustle and grind you know for the dollar and and I still like to help people you know that's in my nature and you know and I'm very compassionate and empathetic but you know the money had done something to me you know the money had like totally changed me and and um I, I found myself making a lot of decisions in my life you know based off of money and not based off of what's right and what's wrong what's like what's good in my heart you know and uh so long story short and, and this was all in like probably the six months leading up to my first you know my first quest so we we ended up you know i sold the business and uh with that you know i got rid of a very narcissistic relationship with one of my partners that were, you know, that was in that business and which I didn't even know until it was over. And, uh, so, you know, going into the, you know, going into my, my first quest, I, I was like, just lost. Like, I, I didn't know who the hell I was. And, um, I wore a lot of different hats and I know I could be different people, you know? And, and so for me, just, you know, going in, letting go of all of that you know because then it was like oh dana he you know he owns a treatment center oh dana he's this guy he's this he's you know i was and that kind of brings up one of the lines in the poem about you know but it's like who am i am i just who people like see me to be you know or like who am i and so you know for me <laughs> You know, at that point, I thought I had it all figured out because I was financially stable. You know, I had the family. I had this going on. But, you know, I found out real quick that, like, I was in a I was in a huge I was on the precipice of a huge transition in my life. <clears throat> and. Uh, and there was a lot of things that, like, you know, and it was almost like I didn't, like, choose to give this stuff up. It just like, you know, all that stuff happened at once, you know, and it was like, what am I going to do about it? You know, am I going to, am I going to hold on to that and keep trying to live that life? Or am I going to like take the plunge? You know, am I going to jump in and, and try something new? And thank God I did, you know? So. Thank you, Dana. So a couple of severance stories and, um, I'll fill in some of the spots with uh, a story of calling. Um, so uh, for me, a story of calling was my father's death. And upon his death, sparked some memories of wanting to do something like this when I was around 14. And I could describe it to people, but I didn't know the name of it. But I remember talking about it. And, um, and all of that went underground. And yet when my father died, those memories flooded back. And I found myself just longing to go into nature. I would drive, drive to work. Uh, I was practicing as a, uh, I was working in private practice as a therapist. And I would drive to work by these sections of forest. And I just wanted to get out of my car and just go in there and disappear. Um, it was just so much grief, so much unresolved. And that's all I knew that like that was the place I needed to go. Um, and I found myself through a series of, of really unusual calling experiences um, of, uh, that led me to the mountain. And when I say unusual, everything from thinking about should I do this thing called Vision Quest and at that very moment looking up and seeing three covered wagons drawn by horses with uh, going down the road, this two-lane country road, 
and on the side it said Vision Quest. Um, another one of those uh, unusual calling moments was um, going home and laying out these cards called safe, Sacred Path cards, like divination cards, and literally drawing the Vision Quest cards three times in a row. Like I shuffled them up, laid them out face down, and I drew that same card three times in a row. Uh, to um, going to a church invited by a friend and I'm envisioning like being up on the mountain and it's like I have enough, I had enough psychological awareness like oh when you go out there like everything you're afraid of is going to come to visit in some form internal or external and you have to deal with this stuff and uh, having been raised as an Irish Catholic um, I thought you know that was my first entry into um, that was my first entry into ritual and um, for me it wasn't a bad experience growing up that way so I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna take a small cross as a way to honor my ancestors and, and honor this introduction into a ritual and the service ended and the, I got a tap on the shoulder and I turned around and there were these two really tall elders they looked like they're in their 80s both had long gray hair and they both looked down at me because I was at six one. I was still looking up at them, and uh, they both looked at me. And the man looked at me in particular. He said, "I'm supposed to give you this." And he reached out and he put that little cross in my hand that I had been seeing in my mind just minutes earlier. Um, and then the final, not the final thing, but uh, uh, getting. Uh, as strange as this one sounds, as if those don't sound strange enough, um, opening a locker in a, um, a health club that I had I usually go and work out at when I was a young man. Um, and I opened that locker and this thing flew out of the locker like a dart and hit me in the center of the chest with some, some heft so much of that it startled me. And I looked down at the floor and there were four feathers and they were red, yellow, black, and white. And that's the colors of the medicine wheel. And so at this point, um, it's getting a little scary, this calling. And uh, it seems like something other than just me wants me to do this. So I went and told uh, this a mentor of mine. I was a psychologist and also uh, spent some time in the, um, with the Sun Bear tribe out in Washington. And he said, well, I think you better listen or they're going to start, uh, they're not going to continue to be so nice about this. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think you're right. I think they've been pretty, pretty easy about this so far. And so I ended up going up on this, uh, finding this, this quest um, that I was supposed to go on. And of course, the last night of the quest, I'm on the mountain, and I realize that it is exactly two years to the very night that my father died. So that the thing had come full circle. Um, so that was my calling. Um, a little, a couple of little threshold uh, moments was that in that particular quest, I had a, a vision, more like a, a, a personal grief ritual, I would call it, more than a vision, which I spent the whole day, the whole third day on the quest, just crying. And I kept repeating the words, bring the people home, bring the people home, bring the people home. And that's all I could say. I didn't know what it was about, but every time I would say it, I would just keep crying more, bring the people home. Um, and that was that, that reference I made earlier about 15 years later, you discover something, you didn't know what, what was happening. That was one of those moments. Everything I thought that meant, even years after doing this work, like 15 years later, I had this awareness like, oh, that's what it's about. You know, at first I didn't know who the people were. Then I thought, oh, it's all these people that I'm working with. And then at 15 years later, it's like, oh, it's me. It's me. Like, bring me home. And so uh, that was a, a threshold experience for me on that quest. Um, of course, the, the, the return um, was, uh, there's also the threshold, well, I'll say there's also the threshold experience of what the hell am I doing out here? What the, what was I thinking? 
to come out here and not eat for four days. <laughs> and uh, that's when all, all the things you think you're going out there for fall away and break down. And then you just you're, you're kind of like, what am I doing out here? And that's that's kind of the gatekeeper to something deeper. Um, and uh, and then the return, that kind of re-entering the village and feeling that the 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 community of people that were there that sent me out, like really feeling the village receiving was really powerful. And then the giveaway, um, well, I'm still working that one because even being on this webinar here tonight is part of that giveaway from, from that first quest many, many years ago. So the, um, so we could go on and on, and I'm sure as we've talked about severance stories, calling stories, threshold stories, return stories, you have your own. And, and as we've spoke about these things, you may even find yourself, yeah, that's what it feels like I am. Um, even noticed in the chat box, um, somebody saying that this idea that um, I don't know what to do, like saying that and utter almost uh, grief and desperation, like that's a prayer. And so I say, yeah, that's that's where I am. That's my prayer right now. I don't know what to do. Um, so I'm sure that, that all of you have similar stories of your experience uh, in life. Uh, just kind of by the fire of living, you have been through certain things that have broken you, that have awakened you. Uh, periods of time where you've been in the threshold phase of not knowing and and. Uh, we're able to lean into something greater than yourself during that time to, to na help you navigate that land landscape. Um, and then your returns to, to uh, finding that new map and beginning to live into the story. Uh, of uh, It's kind of like writing. It's a, a Maybe it's from a, either a Mary Oliver poem or a John O'Donohue poem, like right, uh, from the ashes of your old life, you etch a new story. Um, I really love that imagery. Like from the ashes of, of your old life, you begin to write your new story. Um, and that being of the return. So I want to uh, pause for a moment and uh, allow any uh, questions that may be circling out there. Or if they're comments, not stories so much, because we want to uh, keep to our time frame, but uh comments that might be brief or questions that we can speak to. Um, so if, you, if there's any, anyone has any of those, you can uh, un, undo your mic and just speak or raise your hand so we'll know. And if not, I don't see any hands up. Oh, there's Daniel. We've got one hand, Maria. Hey. hey, Maria. Am I, uh, am I okay to speak now? or should? Yeah, oh, I didn't know you were raising know. your hand too, Daniel. He actually raised his physical hand like this. Got it. <laughs> Missed that. That works better. All today. right. Daniel yeah. and then Maria. <laughs> I was actually guys. thinking physical hand too. I forgot we had these little symbol hands. <laughs> yeah. I feel more connected to my physical one. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, just... Thank you so much. I, I have had experiences with all of you that have touched me so deeply through Vision Quest. And, uh, you know, it just, um, I, I want to speak just briefly to the return because I have found myself um, able to return to myself and to my ancestors directly through my experience with the Vision Quest. And I can still see each one of you that I have quested with, Callie and Cater and Dana, and like, as I returned to you and my village after a quest, I felt held and I felt like I was with my tribe. And it was the kind of return that still brings tears to my eyes right now when I think about it. So that's what I wanted to, to just briefly touch on is like the visceral connection I received in returning to my family in the form of my ancestors and then also to my tribe in the form of you guys um it it nourishes me to this day and so i'm just so alive with that feeling and so glad to see you all today and um thank you for listening what i had to say about uh my return to myself mm, thank you daniel and maria 
Maria. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for everybody's shares. I appreciate it. A lot of the times, a lot of tears came to my eyes because I can really um, sympathize and empathize with what you're saying. And the calling is there, but the fear is there also. And I have never camped maybe once when I was 12. And um, a, fr a friend say that, you know, the, my idea of camping is the next holiday in. So <laughs> it's like being in nature, I love nature, but I want my space to be protected in that bugs, when the bugs enter or, you know, and I've never been in a tent. So I feel fearful and uncomfortable and I don't know how I can do it. Um, I don't know what the accommodations are. I mean, and um, so I'm bringing it up because I would like some answers because I would love to come. I don't know whether this particular quest is the one that I would be coming, but, but I know that I have been wanting to do this for a very long time. And, and, and the way that you're presenting it, it's so beautiful. And this is what was bringing tears to my eyes. So the logistics of it and um, where am I going to be and uh, will I have like a journal or can I paint? Um, am I going to have water to drink and what's going to happen if bugs come in <laughs> like that? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you. Kelly, you mm -hmm. want to take that one? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the the edge of uh, the wilderness and the outdoors and and uh, yeah, in terms of the logistics, just to speak to a couple of the specific questions. Yes to water. Yes to paints. Yes to journal. Um, those are all uh, those are all things that you would have with you um, during your time. And in terms of the bugs, we have. Uh, they they will be there, <laughs> and we have many ways that we we help mitigate the the bugs. Um, fortunately, living in the mountains in the evenings and the mornings, we don't have to deal with with too many bugs. And during the day, uh, we have bug spray and clothing and things like that. But you know, I uh, just quickly, I used to have this real big fear of spiders. <laughs> <laughs> and they would find me, Maria, they would find me in my bathtub <laughs> for years. And over the years, we developed a relationship. And now they are an ally to me. And we work together. So just to name that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I understand. I'm, I'm okay with them being outside. And when I do find a spider or whatever, you know, I'm trying to take it out in the kindest way possible. But um, anyway, this is something that's, you know, has crossed my mind many times. Thank so, you. I'll say a little bit more to that, uh, Maria, mm -hmm. which is um, with the quest from the moment one registers, the process begins, whether it's mm -hmm. a year out or whether it's tomorrow for this August quest, mm -hmm. August 15th. Um, and there's certain ceremonies of preparation. There's conversation. Um, you, when you arrive at base camp, you're at base camp doing a lot of preparation, uh, ritual preparation, uh, what we call the physical plane preparation, which is what you're talking about. All those kind of physical, practical, how to, how to do this and what to do if. Like we have a whole big meeting about that. But there's a lot, there's like five days of preparation uh, with ceremony and with physical plane information and, and safety information before you ever go out. And because mm -hmm. you're on the land for five days, you know the land pretty well even before you go out. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, uh, it also reminds me of um, a teaching a friend of mine gave me years ago. He was an outback survivalist. Uh, down in Australia, and he would deal with the most dangerous snakes in the world, and um, and he would also teach people how to work with these snakes and how to move them from places like uh, mines when when they would get into the mines, and how to talk to the people that work there, how to take move the snakes, and he always began 
Um, Kelly's comment about how she came to be in relationship with spiders differently reminded me of what uh, my friend Bob told me down there. He said, you know, when I would go in to teach people about these most dangerous snakes in the world, he said, I would always begin the conversation that, uh, like this. He said, when you are born, you are only afraid of two things that are instinctual. One is that fear of falling, um, and the other are animal growls. It's an instinctual reaction in the body to animal growls. He said, other than that, everything you're afraid of, you learn somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then he says, so fear plus knowledge equals respect. Mm -hmm. I thought that's powerful. Fear plus knowledge mm -hmm. equals respect. So he said, I'm going to teach you how to respect these creatures, but not mm -hmm. be afraid of them. And so that's part of the preparation at base camp when we get into talking about um, there are three aspects of the experience that the guides listen to. Uh, when we're screening people um, to find out where their edges are going to be. Mm -hmm. And one of them is fasting. And one of them is solitude. And one of them is exposure to the natural world. Mm -hmm. So, Given what you said, which one do you think your comments fall into? Exposure. Yes. <laughs> so they, so we, and that's what I heard. It's like, oh, this is a, a, a fear of exposure. You know, what happens to people is they, they pick out one thing about their fear and then they project all their anxiety into that one place. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's uh, spiders or ticks or snakes or bugs or wild beasts, <laughs> um, it kind of all goes in that direction. And so mm -hmm. part of the, in a sense, the physical plane meeting is to give you the knowledge so that you know how to respect the, the, the creatures of the land should you encounter any. Um, and not be afraid of them. And so that's what the physical plane meeting and that preparation is about. Okay. Other questions, comments, okay. curiosities? Sarah um, has her hand up. Hey, Sarah. Okay. Hello. Um, actually, I you spoke about one of my edges, which is the end question, which is around fasting. So I, I was curious about the... Um, I know that there's the four days. And so is there a reason that it's four days versus is there a reason for the number, I guess, because some people, you know, say maybe different numbers of that. So I'm curious about the number of days. And I guess this question comes because I am small on the size of like a 12 year old and the weight of a 12 year old. And so I'm curious about, you know, fasting for four days. I fasted for a day. And so I'm curious about the logistics of that and maybe the reasons for four days, if there is one, so. So I'll go ahead and speak to that. So yes, the four days is based on the medicine wheel. So there are four, four directions, four days as part of the ceremony. Yes, there are different uh, uh, vision prayer fasts or, or, or vision fasts or um, that will do different numbers of days. Sometimes that has to do with the age and developmental stage that a person is in. Um, I would say you are not the smallest that I have seen out on the mountain. Um, and uh, if there are no medical contraindications for such fasting, um, a four day fast Will, will mainly have psychological effects. Um, you do have water. You do have electrolyte replacement drink should you need it or replacement powder to go in your water in case you would need it. Um, and I'll also tell you, um, after 30 years of doing this work, um, that the thing that surprises people the most is that the, the idea like that hunger becomes kind of a non-issue. I would say unless you're 25 or younger, I've noticed that. <laughs> but for for most adults, they are mostly surprised that, oh, you know, like after the first day, I was just drinking water. Like I didn't even think about it after that. Um, and so it's, it's uh, and we can also examine the, the, uh, the, the positive impact of fasting. 
of people with chronic uh, pain disorder that found that they were pain free by like the third or fourth day. Um, and as soon as they introduced certain kinds of food back into their diet, their pain came back. Um, so there, and there are ceremonial aspects to the fasting. I say um, empty belly, open heart. Um, so it does tend to allow us to, uh, to reconcile those things that sometimes get, get covered up or suppressed with, with food or, or distractions that way. Um, but again, if there's, unless there was some medical contraindication for you fasting, um, I, I wouldn't see a, a problem with it at all. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, Maria. Is it possible to put the poem that you read in the beginning on the screen again, so that I can take a screenshot or if you could send it to us in, in a show you where you can find it okay um, so if you go to our i'll share my screen let me share my screen with you again um where's the oh i should go a little bit further down on my on I don't have the technological wizardry of a teenager so bear with me <laughs> me neither so it's okay I understand okay now we'll go to share screen okay so here's our website if you go to the website and you go up to this button that says what we do mm -hmm. And you go down to the blog page and click on that. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see a whole assortment of uh, things to listen to and read. And that particular um, follow your name mm -hmm. is so a lot of these are videos and some of them are poetry. Mm -hmm. um, Wow, there is a lot. Yeah, this is uh, on our YouTube page. We probably have about 70 or 80 different videos mm -hmm. of different interviews and teachings, but uh, they're not all on the blog page. We just have some of them here, but I know that poem is in here. Mm -hmm. There it is. Oh, yeah. it's so it's on the second page of that. Okay. Um, okay. Here. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And looks like Liz has a, her hand up. Let me get out of this thing here that I'm in. There we go. Okay. Yes, Liz. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for showing us the blog because um, I had not gone there and it looks amazing. Um, Maria, can I just say, I really hope you join us in August. I have not camped for 30 years and I'm also very fearful of exposure. <laughs> I completely understand that. If that's right for you, it'd be wonderful to, to um, join up with you there. I have um, a question about the ritual and then I have a really, um, real basic biological question, but um, do we actually bring our ancestor stone with us on the quest? I mean, do we bring it to the retreat? Kelly? Yes, yes and yes. Yeah, bring it with okay. you and then uh, often people will choose to bring it with them for their questing time. Okay. Yeah, there's some okay. ceremonies okay. that we'll offer that you might want to do with it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then the, the biological one is um, in base camp, is there 
uh, bathroom facilities, anything like that? Can you kind of explain what's available to us in that setting? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have a porta potty, porta john, and we also have a composting toilet. So both of those will be there. And in terms of uh, bathing, we have a really beautiful, clean river, <laughs> which you're welcome to bathe in as well. Other questions, comments? Uh, Jenna. Jenna. Hello. Um, this just came to me because she asked this question. Um, and I just decided to do this this morning. So I'm kind of feeling into what uh, I'm getting into here. But what is an ancestor stone? So, um, so on the, go ahead. You go ahead, Cal. You got it. Okay. Yeah. On the welcome letter that you received when you registered, there's a, a lot of information to get through. But in that welcome letter, there's a, a ceremony that's uh, recommended as preparation. And what that ceremony is finding an ancestor stone. And then there's a particular ritual that you do with that ancestral stone. And so Jenna, we'll connect um, to have a call. So if you have more questions about that, we can connect and I'll walk you through it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Also, um, <laughs> let me say this in terms of that particular, in terms of the welcome letter and the ancestor stone question, I'm taking you back to the blog page. Um, and just, uh, go to, Okay, so on the first of the blog page, you see um, where it says, Vision Quest Ceremonies of Preparation, this one. Y'all see that one? So that mm -hmm. is a, um, it's a video uh, that describes all the ceremonies of preparation. Um, so you have a link in that welcome letter, you click on the link and it'll take you there and then just watch the video. And then once you watch the video, then Callie can answer any other questions you have. Anything else? Okay. So, um, just outlining, I'm going to give you the, the, the larger choreography of the experience. We've talked about just the phases. And I'm going to walk you through um, in a very brief way, because there's so, so much more than I can tell you in just a couple of minutes. But there's, there are the ceremonies of preparation and the welcome letter and things to read and all of that that you get as soon as you register. You, you start into the preparation process. Um, then there's the, the, in this case, then you'll have a phone call with Callie once you go through that letter. Um, then when you, ar then you arrive, you arrive on the 15th. Um, and that first day is about arriving, setting up, base camp, um, uh, having lunch together, um, doing some initial welcoming ceremonies of, of, uh, walking the land and, and going through what we call the four gates. Um, then there's uh, uh, ceremonies of uh, other ceremonies of arriving that I can't really take too much to go into detail. But the first day is dedicated to, to really arriving and bringing your story. Um, and, and at some point during the day, uh, you'll sit with everyone in the circle um, in the lodge and you get to answer the question, what brings you to this fire? And so we hear from everybody, what brings you to the fire? And we always say in truth, your entire life brings you to this fire. But what of that, in, what of that life has brought you here? Um, the second day we, uh, you move into uh, medicine wheel work and there's a particular teachings around the medicine wheel um, that we offer that helps you identify your strengths and your challenges on the wheel. 
or where you're, where, what places in the wheel are you strong? What places are challenging? Um, and you begin to identify that, that placement on the wheel. Then there's some storytelling and then you move into what's called ritual process death lodge work. Um, death lodge is a term that is often associated with the ceremony of the quest because it's a death and rebirth ceremony. So death lodge, uh, like the ceremony, is where you begin. We say in life, you begin with birth and end with death. In initiation, you begin with the ceremonial death and you end with birth. So it runs opposite the flow of life. So the ritual process death lodge work is you, there's a, that goes on for a couple of days. Um, very intensive healing work to help you clarify, to do some healing and clarification of what it is you're going up on the mountain to mark. Um, and then following uh, death lodge ceremony, the next day you have in the morning a physical plane meeting uh, where we talk about what everything we were talking about with Marie and the rest of you, like all the, the what ifs and nuts and bolts of being on the land for four days and nights and how you're going to do that safely. Um, and then you uh, walk the land and find your spot. And um, once you find your spot, then we decide where everybody's going to be. And then that night before you go out on the mountain, we have a sweat lodge ceremony. That's where I'll see you again. Um, so I'll be pouring that lodge with the questers. Um, and that'll be the night before you go out after sweat lodge, we have a, a feast and then off to bed. And then we wake y'all up at sunrise for the threshold ceremony in which we'll come to the fire. And each of you one at a time will step through the fire ring and, uh, and be asked a question. What is it you wish to mark with this ceremony? And by all of that time at base camp and all of that preparation, you'll have a statement. What is it you wish to mark with this ceremony? Who or what would you like to dedicate this time on the mountain to? And what are the prayers that you wish for us to speak on your behalf at this fire uh, while you're out there on the mountain? And then everybody will be smudged off and then they'll head out. And the staff will tend that fire 24 hours a day. They'll take shifts sitting by the fire and speaking your prayers and singing songs and connecting with you through the fire. And then on the fifth morning, you return. And there's a, a threshold ceremony to welcome you back and a big feast. And often sleeping and swimming in the river occurs very shortly thereafter that return. <laughs> Resting and journaling. And then uh, in the afternoon, um, you'll enter the Council of Elders. And that's a reference to sitting in circle and uh, where now your stories are heard. And uh, you'll, each person that has gone up on the mountain will share their story of what happened. Um, and then the staff will mirror back to you what they hear in your story uh, that speaks of your medicine and your gifts and, and also the road ahead of where you're going. And then... Um, and that'll go on for like uh, two half days. And then by the, the second part of the next day, after that's complete, we have what's called a giveaway ceremony, which is explained in the information. Um, then there's the making of something with uh, arts and crafts that I can't tell you what it is because we give away the surprise, but you'll craft something with your hands that you will take with you. Um, and then, uh, then that final night, there's a big celebration around the fire. And then the next day of the departure, there is a, a story of the return. And then there's, there's a discussion about returning and how do you return? Um, how do you take this back and how do you go back? Um, feeling often very different than when you arrived. How do you hold this, this uh, experience? And so we talk about all of those things about the return and how to return back and stay connected. And then, um, and then we do a closing ceremony and then you uh, walk off the ceremonial grounds in the same way that you walked in um, and are ushered back to your vehicles. So arriving on a Tuesday morning, 
um, in the morning as the welcome letter indicates and then uh, departing on a Friday afternoon, say around uh, one o'clock, uh, one to two-ish roughly um, by the time you get all packed up and head out. So that's, and, and interspersed in all of that, there's poetry, there's song, there's other ceremonies and rituals that occur within the group around fire and, and water and earth and just like a, so many other things. But that's kind of the overarching choreography of the 11 days. Um, and then there'll be a month later after you return, there'll be a... Um, a scheduled follow-up Zoom call like with like this, except with the Vision Quest group, in which you get to check back in and hear how people are landing and what's happening, um, and also any any other uh, if there are other ways you wish to plug in and continue this work, some some talk about that. So that's kind of the overarching uh, choreography of the of the experience. Um, uh, there are two spots left in the August quest at this time that I'm aware of. Um, and so if you're uh, feeling that, you might want to step into one of those spots. Um, and as far as other opportunities, uh, Kelly, are y'all taking any more um, people into the, uh, the Seasons of Womanhood ritual immersion um uh, Mm -hmm. weekend yeah we are so that starts next wednesday for the ritual immersion and the ritual immersion is a, a piece of a larger program a nine-month program that we do uh, myself and three other women uh, do this cat and tree and bee and so the the first portion is online the second portion is the ritual immersion that Cater is speaking of, and that's a five-day process. And then the third portion is in October, and that is a Vision Quest. And so it's a, that 11 days that we that Cater was just talking about. It's it's that broken up over nine months um, with the theme of it's a women's quest, so it's women's work. And we center around working with the archetypes, um, feminine archetypes. And so we deepen into particularly uh, in this upcoming one next week, we'll be doing some elemental rituals with fire and water and earth and air to deepen into relationship with the feminine archetypes. And uh, yeah, and I believe that Shauna knows a little bit about that. Yeah. So, so yeah, we have we have a few more spots. Yeah, so there's that. If if that calls to you, and um, let's say the Vision Quest begins on the 15th of August, um, and because there's some preparation, I wouldn't wait too long if you were feeling called to that. Um, and the the women's ritual immersion begins uh, next Wednesday, um, and that's listed on the on the website under uh, Seasons of Womanhood. You can uh, go there or contact Callie from the website. Um, what else is coming up? We have, oh, there's a, a weekend that I'm doing that's, um, it's a standalone weekend and it's also part of a three session component. So it can be taken individually or taken as part of a, 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 a smaller training, which is a, a cowrie shell divination training that I do. Um, and the next session that begins August 9th is called Sacred Site Activation. And that's a Wednesday to Sunday format. And you can find that on the website. It says there's some upcoming events. If you are called to the quest, and for some reason this August quest is not working out on your schedule to, to do, um, the very next quest we're going to have will actually be in southern Spain um, in around uh, March 18th um, of next year. And that's a place we'll be we'll be returning to that same uh, to those ceremonial grounds. This will be our third time back to that one place in southern Spain um, where you can it sits at the, the mouth of, of the Gibraltar Strait. Matter of fact, from the questing grounds you can see Africa across the water 
um, and that'll be in March if you're feeling called to, to a quest and you can't do this one. Um, and we'll also have back here in the Asheville area, um, like the August quest, where we'll be back here in April and May and again August next year. So those are kind of the, the those aren't really listed on the website yet. I'm just giving you the, the months that they're happening. Um, and if you're interested in any of those, you know, let us know because we can, we'll put your name in. And then once we get it listed, we'll let you know once it's up on the website. Um, trying to think what else. Oh, there's one other thing. There's um, a men's encampment, a men's ritual encampment that's, I believe, in October this year. Um, that's happening as a, um, I can't remember if it's a Wednesday to Sunday or Thursday to Sunday format. So those are some various things that uh, you might be interested in plugging into. Um, and to see if you have interest about the, the Seasons of Womanhood program, just contact Callie from the website. Um, and uh, yeah, so any questions about any of those offerings or, or information about any, any of those offerings? Okay, so we've uh, come to the end of our time, and I like to end with a poem in the way that I begin with a poem. Um, let me find, Google this one real quick. Um, I don't think this one is on our blog page, so I will give you the author, the, the writer of the poem after I read it and the name of it. Uh, so it goes like this. There is a door. Either you will go through this door or you will not go through. If you go through, there is always a risk of remembering your name. Things look at you doubly, and you must look back and let them happen. If you do not go through, it is possible to live worthily, to maintain your attitudes, to hold your position, and even die bravely. But much will blind you, much will evade you, and at what cost, who knows? The door itself makes no promises. The door itself makes no promises. It's only a door. So it's a poem by Adrian Rich, and it's called The Door. For those of you that would like to look that up, Adrian Rich, the poem is called The Door. So we end there. Um, if uh, some of you have further comments or questions and would like to stay on, well, the, the staff will stay, stay visible until everybody's gone. But if not, um, we will see, hopefully see you down the road sitting around one of these fires sometime soon. So good night, everyone. Go well. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I do have one more question. Um, yeah. So I was, I have a hammock. Um, and I was thinking about bringing it and a, a mosquito net or something like that. Um, what are your thoughts about that? I think that's a great idea. I say bring it. There are a couple of spots uh, in particular on the land that are great, questing spots on the land that are great for hammocks. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. And we don't usually have, I mean, you can bring your mosquito netting. Um, we don't usually mm -hmm. have problems with mosquitoes. I can't think of a time we've had, but, oh, but okay. bring it anyway. Okay. All right. And when we're out, on our four days solo, we don't have a tent, correct? We're we're doing just open air, whatever. Okay, right. that's so right. Yeah. Like if you did a if you did a 
uh, hammock, you just set your tarp over your hammock as yeah. usual. If okay. You're not doing a, okay. If you're not doing a hammock, you'd have a tarp and a ground cloth. So you'd be covered overhead okay. and covered on the bottom. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate the information. You're quite welcome, Maria. Thank you. Bye bye, well. everybody. Thank you. Bye, Maria. Thank you. See you in a few weeks. <laughs> See you in a few weeks, Liz. <laughs> bye. bye. Good night. Good night. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to thank you. I'm really, this call is really well timed because I'm about to send in my deposit for the training program. So I just wanted to say. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Samara. Good to see you. Yeah, you'll be one of those Spain vision questers. <laughs> awesome. It feels so right. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much for doing this. It just kind of helped, helped me step through that door, <laughs> which I'm already already definitely through, but this, this is the... Great. Well, we'll see you in September then. Go well. Good night. All right, you two. Maybe we drummed up some more business for you. We'll see. Hold um, on a second. Is Ellen still here? I don't see any more people. There's one person. Ellen. Ellen, are you with us? Um, maybe she was going to watch the video. Okay. Let me go ahead and stop the recording.